Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring us the retrospective for UFC Fight Night where Cynthia Calvillo dismantled Jessica I and the Fight Night picks for Blades versus Volkov. We came in at just 50% accurate for the Calvillo versus I card, but we went 2-1 and one on the Patreon, so no matter what, we ended up in the money off of those Patreon picks and we were better or at least as good as 50%. So not the happiest fight as far as fight picks go, but there were a lot of debuters on the card. You know, those are those are tough to uh, make uh, heads or tails of just because of the amount of data available. But let's talk about it. Let's get into it. Here's the show. <laughs> Let's start with our look back. So, like I said earlier, Cynthia Calvillo dismantled Jessica I. This was one that I called correct. This is probably my happiest call of the night because I think a lot of people were just looking at I to win. You know, and I was going through MMA Twitter, a lot of people were seeming to be disappointed that I ended up picking up an L here. Uh, Maybe they had some parlays out there, but we steered clear of that trap and we picked up Calvillo for a great win. Um, I mean, what is there to say, really? She outstruck her handily. She put her on the ground every time she had to make a statement in the round. There was really at no point I thought Jess Guy had hurt, had rocked, had done anything to Calvillo uh, where she could have turned the tides. Like I said, the striking of Calvillo was there, and then even if if it felt like it was going to be a 50-50 round, which some rounds were close, but Calvillo put her on the ground, made the statement, showed the judges who was winning at the end, ending the rounds on top, putting in a little bit of ground and pound, putting in the work, showing that she was determined to be the victor that night, and she got exactly what she deserved by picking up a unanimous decision W in that event. So hats off to Cynthia Calvillo. I look forward to your next performance. All right, so let's go on to the next one. Great performance here. Marvin Vittori, $50,000 performance of the night money. We called this one as well. This was our second Patreon pick, so i uh, just throw that out there. We did get Calvillo on the Patreon, Vittori, and I took a shot on her because she was such a dog, uh, but we did miss out on Gina Manzani, and we'll get to that one down later. Uh, she was just destroyed, but I thought for the you know plus 450 money, she was worth taking a chance on. Anyways, we'll get to her. Marvin Vittori, Carl Roberson, this was a fight that was building for a long time. Marvin Vittori was sort of robbed of his opportunity to fight Roberson uh, due to a weight problem. He had weight problems again uh, coming into this fight. I mean, these guys, uh, they just don't like each other, it seems, from a professional level. Vittori obviously makes weight, goes out there, answers the bell. Carl Roberson, you know, not making weight, canceling the fight, pushing it off, taking money out of Vittori's pocketbook, all that stuff, it adds up, it wears on you as a pro, you want to fight guys that want to be there, that want to, I mean, just kind of get back to, Jessica, I had a similar problem, she was also doing the same kind of stuff, trying to come in a little heavy, trying to cheat, whatever, however you want to look at it, but Roberson, not a pro, came into the fight, not looking too good, uh, at least in the eyes of me. Right, and then he gets in there, he throws four strikes in total, Vittori gets him on the ground, great ground and pound, sneaks in for the rear naked choke, he was trying to sneak in a few submissions with his ground and pound, and picks up a great rear naked choke submission victory, just four minutes and 17 seconds into round number one. It was a great call by us, I'm looking forward more out of Vittori, his striking was on fire, his takedowns, he's he's really honestly a complete mixed martial artist, and I really want to see more out of this guy at middleweight in this very, very competitive division. So, good win by him. Let's see what's coming next for him. All right, and one that I did not get correct, but it was a split decision. We had Charles Rosa defeat Kevin Aguiar. And this one, I really can't, you know... Aguiar had moments, right? He wasn't able to capitalize them. He got a good cut on Rosa. It looked like he could have won, especially about in round number two. But then Rosa just came back. He put you know Boston Strong down, and he just went at it. He bit down on the mouthpiece, and he brought the fight back to Aguiar to really steal the win here in the third. I think Aguiar mostly had it locked up, but he started getting tired. The shots that he inflicted on Rosa weren't enough to slow him down, and he just kept coming in an onslaught, 
and ended up tipping the tides here where Kevin Argiar ended up being the loser, uh, which was our pick. We missed this one, but it is what it is. Hats off to Charles Rosa. I did not think he was going to come off so well against his loss or last fight where he lost to Bryce Mitchell. I thought he would be, you know, probably a little bit worn out, um, not have his head in the game. Whatever it was, he wanted to avenge the loss. He did it. Hats off to him. I cannot... I cannot speak bad about a guy uh, that goes out and puts out a performance to, uh, you know, snatch victory from the jaws of defeat like that. In the next one, Air, uh, Andre Feely defeats Charles Air Jourdain. So this one split decision, but I think it was a good call. Even though Feely was outstruck, Feely scored five takedowns, and while he didn't do, you know, everything with every takedown he got, he still scored them. He scored them almost at will. And he showed that he was a much better mixed martial artist once things got to the mat. And so I think ultimately this one went correctly. I think that Jordan's striking was really good, but he's got to throw in some takedown defense there, or he's got to be able to knock out a guy like Feely to stop that or hurt him, get him on the back foot. Uh, his sprawl and brawl just wasn't really there, and so Feely ends up picking up a great win, and we did get that one correct as well. And the next one, this is really one-sided affair, not too much to say about it. Jordan Espinoza outstrikes Mark De La Rosa, the Bumblebee, 126-37. to 37. Not 137, 37. Espinoza also scores two takedowns. I mean, to De Rosa's credit, he was always in the face of Espinoza. He was trying to walk him down. He was trying to land a big shot, but uh, he just kept getting popped in the face with, you know, a little bit of a, you know, like 50% shot, 50% shot, just keeping him away. Espinoza looked good. He looked strong at the end. He did not look tired and he ended up picking up a great win for us. Then we have Marna Argapova defeat Hannah Cyphers. I called this one kind of like I expected the Rosa Aguiar card to go. Uh, Cyphers, or Cyphers, she comes out. Uh, she just lost recently to Mackenzie Dern, so now she's 0-2 over the course of just a few weeks. And she takes a short-notice fight with this Kazakhstan young product that trains over at American Top Team, and she was dismantled. Uh, Mar- Marna Agapova looked great. She looked like she was having a real lot of fun out there. Uh, she was a phenomenal fighter, and I was really happy to see her get a win, and it was one we were able to call correctly. I think it was the only uh, only debuter fight that I actually think I called correctly. I think I had that one classified as a debut. All right, so then we have our other ones here. Mireb Davele Vishvili versus Gustavo Lopez. So in this one, I had originally called for Davish Vishvili when he was supposed to take on Benoit. I can't, I can't remember his first name. Uh, maybe Brian Benoit, it sounds about right. But uh, I had picked Gustavo just because now I had to use the uh, you know the debut data information, and there wasn't as much. And even though Davish Vila would have been my pick in my heart, the numbers would have said Gustavo, and that's what I went with. Uh, so this was not a Patreon pick, and I don't even think this was on the podcast due to the late replacement nature of it. Uh, but Marab Davish Vishvili uh, picked up a great win here. Uh, his takedowns were phenomenal. He scored 13 of them over 15 minutes. Uh, so just about every minute he had Gustavo on the map. And Gustavo looked okay, at least through the first round. He had hurt Davish Vish, or Marab, let's call him Marab. He had hurt Marab a couple of times. Uh, but uh, by the second round, he just gassed himself out and, you know, is what it is. Then we had Julia Avila defeat Gina Manzani. This one was real fast. Manzani came out of the gate, and uh, Avila caught her with a great shot. Then a good shot to the bo- a good shot to the chin, shot to the body, threw her off kilter, and she covered up on the cage to pick up uh, an L. Uh, and Julia Avila gets a really solid win. So I had picked I had picked Manzani in this one. Uh, she was plus four fifty money. I thought she would have been, you know, a good one to take a chance on. Obviously, when you're looking at plus 450, you know it's a chance. You know it's not the kind of fight that's going to be clear-cut. Uh, but I thought I had an opportunity to pick one up here. Uh, just did not work out for us, and it is what it is. Hats off to Julia Avila. And then the last two contests, Tyson Nam knocks out Zarik Adeshev. Uh, this was another late replacement. We had picked uh, Adeshev. And then the last one, Christian Aguiar uh, takes on Anthony Ivey. I'd picked Ivey going in. This one didn't change, and so we got that one wrong as well. So we were better at the top of the card, worse down at the bottom. Like I said, 5-5, five and five, 50% accuracy. Um, when we're dealing with those debuters, it's just hard because there isn't as much information. And if there is information, it's not really against the highest level competition because they've been fighting outside 
of the UFC at these, you know, not to say anything bad about them, but lesser organizations. You know, they just don't have the same talent pool, and that's just reality of it. You know, majors versus minors is what we're talking about. So let's go on here. We got a new fight night car. There's actually only one debut fight on it, so I got higher confidence about this one. Let's talk about Curtis Razorblades and Alexander Volkov. <laughs> So let's talk about the main event where Curtis Razorblades is going to be taking on Drago or Alexander Drago Volkov. So in this one, two great heavyweights. Obviously, we have the high-tier wrestler, high-tier grappler in Curtis Blades going up against a phenomenal striker in Volkov. Let's go with Volkov's numbers real quick. 10 T- uh, sorry, 20 KOs or TKOs. Three submissions, over 31 wins. We look over at Blades, 10 KOs, zero submissions, over his 13 wins. Now, even though there's no submissions there, it's because Curtis Blades is your classic grappler, ground and pounder, a style that has seen success in the UFC for sure. And in this one, I think it is going to go on the side of the grappler here. I know that Volkov is a good fighter. You know, he is solid. His striking is good. But we've seen Blades deal with everybody else's striking that isn't named Francis Ngannou. And I don't expect things to be much different here. You know, Blades' striking defense, be it because of his threat for the takedowns, is fairly high. It's almost as high as Volkov's himself. Maybe his striking accuracy isn't quite as high. But let's look at the takedowns, though. This is the big story here, okay? 6.63 average takedowns for every 15 minutes, okay? And the takedown defense, while decent out of Volkov, I do not think will be there or his submission game won't be enough of a threat either to make Blades get away from the game plan. He's going to get in there. He's going to try to shut the door very early. He's going to try to put Volkov on his back and shut him down. Also, another thing, Volkov has no reach advantage here. Both of these guys have an 80-inch wingspan, and so nobody has the advantage in either avenue there. So... I think Volkov gets put on his back. I think Blades ground and pounds him, grinds him to dust, saps the gas tank if nothing else, takes the heat off those shots in the later rounds, and I honestly expect this thing not to even see later rounds with Curtis Blades picking up a W very, very early on. I'm calling it round one or two in my personal opinion. So we are picking Curtis Razor Blades in Vegas to win the main event. All right, so now we got to move on to the co-main. So in this one, we got a firefight if there ever was one. It's not a dark horse. It's a great matchup. Josh Emmett taking on Shane Burgos at featherweight. So this is a great way, I think, for Burgos to make a name for himself in a jam-packed division. Josh Emmett, you know, not the highest-tier talent in the world, but let's face facts. This guy has great wins. Look at his last couple wins. TK over Mirasad Bektik, first round. Michael Johnson, third round KO. Ricardo Lamas, Felipe Arante, Arantes. The only one he lost to recently, back in 2018, where, I mean, his face was fractured. Let's not a glance over the fact that this was a devastating loss. Uh, but Jeremy Stevens is really his last loss, uh, other than one Desmond Green in 2017. Ed, uh, Emmett is back as far as I'm concerned, but let's let's look at some of the hitches here because I'll be honest with you, he's not the pick. He's 35 years old, so the light this is the lightweight classes. You got to have the speed. You got to have a little bit of power mixed in. And who has that? Shane, the Hurricane Burgos out of Tiger Schulman's camp. He's 29 years of age. He is also coming off of some good wins. KO over Marquan Armarkani. Split decision over Cub Swanson. A great fighter. A guy that has fallen off recently, but a phenomenal fighter that was fighting for the title not too long ago. And a win back in 2018 against Kurt Hallbaugh. Three-fight win streak. His only loss, okay, in the UFC, as far as I, yep, the only loss, is to Calvin Cater. And look where that guy is right now at his level, okay, and he was on the Miocic and Gano, oh, I was actually, I was actually at that one, that was UFC Boston fight, all right, I saw this one in person, believe it or not, (laughs) anyways, Calvin Cater was the last guy that he lost to, and look at what he's doing right now, he's a high-tier fighter, and I think Burgos makes a name for himself, you know what, I'm, I'm, I gotta pull it back, 
Burgos is a name. He doesn't need to be Emmett to make a name for himself, but it only furthers his rise up the ranks because I believe Emmett is the kind of guy, you know, somebody that's been around for a long time, a guy that's fought and defeated Michael Johnson, a guy that's even just fought Jeremy Stevens, another high tier featherweight. You want to be fighting these guys because it proves you're ready to move up to the next level. I mean, when he fought Cater, he was just a prospect. They both were. Cater's obviously risen to the likes, you know, fighting guys like Sabit and such, and Stevens himself. But this is Burgos' time. It's going to be his time on Saturday. He's going to pick up a win. We're going with the Hurricane on Saturday. All right, not my favorite fight of the night. Raquel Rocky Pennington takes on Mar- uh, Marion Renault. So Renault is uh, fighting in the geriatric. Uh, no, <laughs> she's 42 years old. She had, I, she's probably the oldest female fighter I've actually heard of fighting. And she's taking on Raquel Pennington. And uh, both of them, I mean, not too much to say here. Uh, Renault, 9 and 5. Okay, okay, record. Uh, Pennington, 10 and 8. You know, th- these, are, these are touching 500 levels. Uh, I'm not overwhelmingly impressed with either one of these. If you look over Pennington, uh, since her loss to Noons, she's, uh, well, yeah, including the loss to Noons, she's 1-3 one, uh, in, one in three over the last four. And then we got back-to-back losses for Renault. She fought once in 2018, uh, sorry, twice in 2018. Uh, one win over Sarah McMahon, one loss to Katsingano, and then fought Yannick Sky last year for an L. Um, there's not much here to really say. I think, honestly, Pennington gets it done. I think she picks up a win. Uh, Pennington is good enough, I think, to beat uh, this older fighter as long as she wants it. She's proven that if she's not fighting the best in the world, your Duran and your Holly Holmes, your Amanda Nunes, she can get a win. Um, so I expect her honestly to do it. I mean, she even beat Misha Tate going back in the day here. That's how she ended up setting up herself really to get that Nunes title shot in the first place. She's not the highest tier fighter, but she is certainly somebody that can win. And I expect her to do that on Saturday, despite her mediocre record at best. Uh, so we are going Raquel Rocky Pennington in this contest. All right, now this one will be a firefight for sure. We have Lyman the Cyborg Good, a Tiger Shulman product, take on Bilal Muhammad, remember the name, fighting out of Rufus Sport. These guys are both looking phenomenal right now. And even though we, we saw a little bit of issue for Lyman Good in his Damian Maya fight where he was choked out very early, he came right back and knocked out Chance Rencounter in the third round. Same goes, I looked over at Bilal Muhammad. He had a little bit of an issue with Jeff Neal, came back, beat Curtis Curtius Millinder, and then goes out and chokes Takashi Sato. Picks up two good, really good wins. Both these guys have redeemed themselves since their last losses. Except I think that we're going to have to go honestly here with the slightly younger fighter in Muhammad. I think he's just a little bit better. Despite the fact that Lyman Good, I think, has the power, I think that Muhammad is going to be able to neutralize that through takedowns. His takedown rate is very good, and we have seen Lyman struggle against guys that do shoot and do get takedowns. His takedown accuracy is also okay. K, so I think he should be able to. It's not the best takedown accuracy in the world, but I think if Bilal, Bilal shoots, he will score the takedown. He will get it to the ground, and he will sap the gas tank and take away some of the power from Good. Although Good does have a two-inch reach advantage, and he is obviously a very competent fighter with a lot of power, so we will see how things play out. But I gotta go with Bilal Muhammad in this one. He's the pick. All right, in our next one here, we have a veteran in Jim A-10 Miller taking on Roosevelt the Predator Roberts. So in this one, honestly, you know, I like Jim Miller and everything. He is a phenomenal talent uh, dating back for years, but I think the time is now. The time is for Roosevelt Roberts, and this is going to be a solid win for the Predator. He has great wins over Yankalov and Brock Weaver. And I think that he's going to continue his winning ways and pick up a win against Jim Miller. Like I said, nothing against Jim Miller. You know, he's fought through things like Lyme disease and other personal issues over the years. He was a top competitor for a time. And, you know, he's just getting up there in age. And father time is a killer for us all. And I believe that Roosevelt have the speed advantage. He already has the size advantage. He's 6'2 in this feather. Or Sorry, um... Oh, it's going to be a catchweight bout, it says here. But uh, he's six foot two versus Miller's five foot eight. He's got a good solid two inch reach advantage. His striking output is higher. His takedown rate is better. The only thing I think that uh, Miller has the experience in is if it does get to the ground, 
he has the grappling experience where I think he could potentially nullify Roberts, but I see it being a problem on the feet for him, and I don't know if he's necessarily going to be able to get it to the ground at will against somebody with that good size frame and with solid takedown defense that has been proven in the octagon for Roberts, even though he is only 10 and 1 at the age of 26. I think, honestly, the Predator gets it done. we got to go to Roosevelt Roberts. He's the pick in Las Vegas. All right, moving on to another veteran. Clay the Carpenter Guida is going to be taking on Bobby Green. And in this one here, you know, we're going to go against the veterans again. Even though Clay Guida is a phenomenal talent, he brings the heat. He fights his ass off in there. I think that Bobby Green is the better fighter. However, let's just look at the fact that he's coming off back-to-back -back losses. Granted, they were via unanimous decision. Dracar Close and Francisco Trinaldo, two tough fights. This is going to be another tough fight for him. But I just like Green here a little bit more. I think that he's capable of getting it done. I know that obviously Guida is on the older side of 38 years of age. And he could have a little bit of trouble keeping up with Green, who does seem to at least have okay cardio. So we'll see how things play out in the deeper rounds. I think Guida could honestly shut the door early on here. But in the later rounds, I actually am going to side here with Green. He also has a good size advantage. His striking output is a lot higher. His takedown game isn't quite what Guido's is, uh, but we'll see if he's able to wrestle this thing to the mat and steal it away from Green. Either way, though, we are picking King Bobby Green in this lightweight matchup. All right, in the next one here, we're going to have a ladies matchup. We have Brianna Van Buren, the Bull, fighting out of American Kickboxing Academy, or AKA, taking on Tisha, Tiny Tornado Torres, fighting out of American Top Team. So two phenomenal gyms. Two great fighters here. Two very small fighters as well. Torres is only 5'1", and Van Buren doesn't even come in at 5 feet. She comes in at 4'11 here. So this is honestly a tough call, but I got to look at the history here of Van Buren, even though she only has the one fight in the UFC. She's on a six-fight winning streak since 2018. Granted, that does put her through, through Invicta for the most part, but I think she's talented enough to defeat Torres, who has had... Difficulty lately. Look at her losses. Hasn't won since 2017. Lost Andrade, Joan Jacek, Wele Zhang, Mariana Rodriguez. Rodriguez is a fight she probably should have won. That was a good bounce back fight, but she just proves that she's proven recently she doesn't have it at the highest level. And I don't know if Van Buren's quite at that high level, but if she's training over at AKA, it's iron sharpening iron out there, and she has the skills to pay the bills. We are going with Bianca Van Buren the Bull to pick up her second win in the UFC. All right, our next one here, we have good old Power Bar. <laughs> Marc-Andre Barrier taking on Oscar Pachota. And in this one, I got to go with the Polish fighter all day. I got to go with Oscar Pachota. Nothing against Power Bar, but he is 0-3 in his UFC fights. I think he's about to get bounced out. And while I think, honestly, Pachota could have the same uh, thing happen to him, I think he's lost a little bit higher level competition. And it was uh, Soriano. Adolfo Vieira and Gerald Mearshart. I think, honestly, he's finally fighting somebody he's capable of winning, and I think he has the ability to shut the door on this Canadian power bar product. I think the numbers shake out for him better as well. Better takedown rate, just about as good in the striking department with a lower hit of, where he doesn't he doesn't get hit as much, basically, what I'm trying to say. And he also has a great submission rate. I think he's going to be able to use the striking to set up the grappling and potentially get this thing to the ground. Either way, though, he has 5K it was five submissions, so he's capable of getting it done either way. We are going with the Polish product, Oscar Pachota. All right, our next one here, we are going to have Jillian the Savage Robertson, another Canadian product, taking on Courtney Cast Iron Casey. And in this one here, I got to honestly go with Robertson. Despite her last loss to Macy Barber, where she was kind of steamrolled, I don't think Courtney Casey has those same skills. I don't think she's just going to walk right through Robertson the way that Barber did and I honestly think that Robertson gets it done here she's a very very good fighter with good numbers I think that outclass Casey when you go ahead and look at it we really got to talk about the takedowns where you know the striking that's really Kate and she's department but you know just the three KOs over nine wins in fact she actually has more submissions than she does KOs I don't think it's going to be the hands I think it's going to be the high takedown rate the good accuracy of Jillian that honestly gets it done for her we are going with Gil Jillian is it, it might be Gillian is it Gillian or Jillian <laughs> doesn't matter going with the savage to pick up a win on Saturday. 
All right, this fight is, well, could be low-key fight of the night. Definitely your dark horse. It's real low down on the fight list here, coming in just the third fight of the night. We got Frank the Crank Camacho taking on Matt the Steamroller for Vola. And this is a, an amazing matchup. We've seen the Steamroller on a solid win streak here. He's got a good head of steam, wins over Jalen Turner, split decision win over Luis Pena, and a draw to Lando Venata. The Steamroller is not a, you know, not somebody that you can take too lightly. And Frank the Crank Camacho does have a bit of a history of taking guys lightly. He's looked good in certain outings. Nick Hine, Damian Brown, he looked okay for a time against Drew Dober, but he he has this thing where he likes to throw down and he gets overwhelmed. He was able to do it to Nick Hine, but I don't think he's going to be able to do it to the steamroller. I think it's going to play out a lot like the Benil Dariush fight where Freddy Camacho was just outclassed, taken down, and choked out. Takedowns are for Vola's bread and butter. He's going to put him on the mat. He's going to roll him out. He's going to pick up a great win. We are going with the steamroller for Vola in this contest. All right, we got two here, one one debut, one non-debut. We got Roxanne Modafari taking on Lauren Murphy. So in this one, you know, I not not that uh, Modafari is quite my Angela Hill as far as difficult to call, but I usually get the Modafari fights wrong. But I am going with Lauren Murphy in this one. Uh, they're both older women. You know, obviously Motifari has a lot more experience here, but I still like Murphy here just a little bit more. She has back-to-back -back wins. She beat Mara Barella. She beat Andrea Lee. And I think that she's capable of beating Motifari. Motifari is a great fighter, um, and I tend to get a lot of her fights wrong. Uh, so we'll see how this plays out. She, she could be my second coming of Angela Hill, where these ladies' fights are just hard to lock down. Um, but I am ultimately going with Lucky Lauren Murphy here over the Happy Warrior. We'll see how things play out, though. Uh, but uh, I, I, you know, I, I like Motifari. I got nothing bad to say about her. She always comes out, you know, fun at weigh-ins. You know, she puts on so, like some Dragon Ball Z stuff. And, you know, looks like she's going Super Saiyan. And she's just fun to watch. So uh, hats off to her no matter how this thing plays out. But we're going to go with Murphy in that one. And then for the last contest, it's a debut fight, so we'll take it with a grain of salt here. Like all of the debuts, we have Austin Hubbard taking on Max uh, Roshenkoff. Rosh, Roshkoff? I think it's Roshkoff. Uh, and this one, I am going with Roshkoff. I think that he's a great 5-0 talent. Uh, he stopped everybody via rear naked choke. Five submissions over his five wins. Uh, he just looks like a really hot product, and I think that he can pick up a solid win over Austin Hubbard, a guy that does look good but has struggled with certain grapplers. He obviously was steamrolled by Marco Madsen. Uh, he beat Propolic, lost to Davi Hamos, and I think it could be more of that story with Roshkoff getting into the mat and honestly having his way with Austin Hubbard. That's how I see things playing out in that matchup. So let's go over them one more time. We have Blades, Burgos, Pennington, Muhammad, Roberts, Green, Van Buren, Pachota, Robertson, Frivola, Murphy, and Roshkoff to round things out. So that will be our fight pick for Saturday. Uh, we'll obviously be back with more fight picks in retrospective soon, but if you'd like to get in touch with us in the meantime, please reach out to the show at fightingspiritpodcast at gmail.com. Get in touch with me on Twitter at MMA Fight picks zero one you know about the facebook page you know about the patreon there will be picks coming out probably friday after the weigh-ins that's when i really like to you know take a look at them after things play out there and yeah we'll go from there we'll keep coming at you fast and furious i feel really good about this card since it is made up of a lot of non-debuting fights we get some good data out there and uh, i will be keep bringing them to you so just to take a look at what's coming up we are going to have no layoff. We're going to be going into Poirier versus Hooker on the 27th, and then we'll have a brief layoff until the 11th where we'll have Usman versus Burns going on at Fight Island. Let's take a look at that Poirier-Hooker card, though. This thing is lining up pretty well. Uh, let's see. We have Luis Pena, Kama Worthy, solid fight. I always like watching Violent Bob Ross. Aspen Lad, Sarah McMahon. I'm surprised Sarah McMahon's coming back, but that could be a solid win for Lad, John Vellante, Maurice Green, solid fight. Ian Heinich, Brendan Allen, decent fight. Mickey Gall, Mike Perry, that's a great fight. That looks like the co-main right now. And then obviously Poirier versus Hooker, which is going to be a phenomenal contest. I really hope that either one of those guys can call out like a Conor McGregor so we can get the train rolling back at lightweight. Um, I, that one I think I am going to be pulling for Hooker, but I still got to crunch the fight, so I don't know who I think is going to win, but I want to see Hooker win. Anyways, we'll see how things play out. Until I speak with you again next time, happy fight picking.